Okay, very good. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about um, decentralized peer-to-peer -peer power management and large-scale distributed systems. Okay, so just some background. So in most data centers, supercomputers, things like that, um, between the cost of power delivery uh, and the cost of cooling hardware, um, power budgets are pretty limited. Um, it's a lot of money for to, to supply all of these things, uh, and they require a lot of power. And so um, with a number of different constraints, especially just given power generation limitations, data centers need to operate at really tight power budgets. Um, and secondly, um, data centers, cloud vendors, all these things, they like to over-provision. In other words, there's more hardware than could be powered simultaneously at maximum capacity. Um, the reason for this is that they can do sort of workload movement and things like that. Um, but as a result, uh, if power budgets are violated, uh, we violate cooling constraints and we could potentially damage hardware among other things. So sticking to power budgets assigned to data centers is extremely important. Now, power management systems exist to enforce this constraint. So in other words, if we think of, it's a pretty simple constraint. Every node in a distributed system gets some power budget. The sum of those power budgets has to be less than or equal to the system-wide power budget. A very simple, naive way to do this is static allocation. I get a something, I divide it in some way, nothing changes. We know that the constraint worked at first, so we're good. Um, however, this is obviously not very well tuned to application needs uh, and the differences over time of, of power needs by nodes. So dynamic allocation aims to take advantage of that by moving power cap, by, by sort of increasing and decreasing the power caps of nodes in real time while adhering to the sort of system-wide cap. So as a quick example, um, we have two nodes, each with the same power cap, but node B is operating very close to its power cap, whereas node A is, has some excess that it's not really using. Uh, a dynamic system would aim to move that excess to node B um, using the fact that one, A is operating below its budget, and two, B is operating close to its budget, indicating that it could gain application performance benefits by having a higher power cap. So moving that could have benefits. Um, we're not hurting A because it wasn't using it to begin with. Um, now, existing approaches in dynamic sort of allocation focus on central, have are, are, are centralized approaches. Um, they construct a central server. All nodes actually running workloads communicate their power status to this server. And the server handles all the coordination. It tells what server, it tells servers to lower their cap or increase their cap. Uh, it handles all of this movement between things. Um, now, this is just like a pretty simple flowchart for like a node running a workload, uh, the flow, the sort of uh, what the sort of feedback loop is. So it reads its power cap. Um, okay, it reads its power cap. Uh, it reads its, certain power, its current power consumption and compares it to its assigned power cap, um, and it computes the difference. We set some sort of epsilon error threshold, um, and so if the delta is less than that threshold, we say that this node is power hungry, um, meaning it's consuming close to its cap, it could benefit from more power. So it sends a request to the server for more power, the server gives it what it can uh, based on whatever algorithms they want to implement, and then it adjusts its cap. On the other hand, if the delta is greater than this threshold, then we say, cool, you have excess to give, uh, and it's, it lowers its cap and sends that excess to the server. Uh, by lowering its cap first before sending it, we ensure that no system-wide constraints are violated um, because we're you know, subtracting before we get things like that. Okay, so the issue with central approaches uh, are twofold and they are pretty clear. There's fault tolerance and there's scalability concerns. Fault tolerance, we've constructed a single point of failure. Even if we add redundancies, at some point you have constructed a central mechanism that is your entire system is reliant on existing. Uh, and scalability. Similarly, this, as the size of your data center increases and the number of nodes in your system increases, this central server needs to be handling that load. And all of these messages coming in, um, you know, in this previous flowchart, they're iterating, I think, typically once every second. So they iterate sleep for a second and repeat. Um, so every second you're getting N messages and N responses, and as N grows, that can become increasingly infeasible. So our goal with Penelope was to construct a decentralized dynamic power allocation system. 
rather than relying on a central server to do coordination, we rely on peer-to-peer -peer transactions. So rather than forcing there to be a middleman, we allow, we, we construct a system by which nodes communicate with each other uh, and sort of have power transact, have power move through the system in that way. Um, by removing a central dependency, we add, uh, we increase our fault tolerance and scalability um, since we have no sort of single system that needs to scale with the size of our system. Now, this is a pretty quick diagram on how this works. So the red nodes here are power hungry and the blue nodes are power, have excess power. Um, the red node, um, the, the way that we construct um, this is that every node running an application has two processes. Practically, these are implemented as just what, two threads in a single process. Um, there's a client and a server. The server acts as a local power pool. So whatever excess power that has been released by this node is stored locally in this sort of server process. There's a client which executes a feedback loop, which I'll get to in a second. When it has excess power, it gives it to, it, it gives it to its local server. When it needs power, it randomly probes the system and attempts to find another node uh, and talk to its local power pool and see if it has any excess. And so here, what we see is we see this red node here um, sends a random request, asks a blue node for excess power and gets a response. Um, additionally, because there is local power available, we also enable the red nodes to ask itself, hey, did I previously free power that's still here and can I access that? So we first check locally, then go into the system. Um, and finally, if a node has excess power, um, the choice that we make is allow, uh, if nodes are in need of power, they search, uh, rather than having nodes in excess of power search. So if a node has excess power, it won't do anything. It will just continue to operate. If every node in the system has excess power, then there is no need to communicate, and so there is there are no messages sent. Um, communication is driven by nodes that need power. So this is a modified flowchart for Penelope. So really the two things that are changing are these boxes in red. Um, if we have excess delta, if we have excess power, we add that to a local power pool rather than commuting, communicating externally. If we need power, we check locally and then take a rant, probe a random node and uh, check it uh, and, and communicate with it and see if it has any excess power for us. So, to evaluate uh, sort of Penelope in, in contrast to these centralized systems, um, we want to evaluate three things. The first is under, you know, we're obviously talking about fault tolerance and scalability, but under pretty nominal conditions, there aren't really faults, there aren't, it isn't at huge scale. We want to evaluate to understand, I mean, does Penelope still sort of keep up? Is there an inherent flaw with using decentralized systems? Next, we want to evaluate, well, what happens when a fault is introduced? And finally, we want to evaluate, well, what happens as scale increases? Um, and can we simulate how Penelope would stand up against sort of centralized systems in at larger scale and with more frequency of messages? So for uh, those first two, sort of the nominal and the faulty conditions, we use a 20 node cluster, uh, each with two CPUs, um, and we compare three systems. We compare Penelope, we compare Slurm, a state-of-the-art centralized system, and FAIR. FAIR is a naive static allocation. You get a system-wide power cap, we divide it by N, and then we're good to go. Um, so what we want to evaluate here is how Penelope compares to a centralized system under nominal conditions. Um, the axes here are performance and the power cap per socket per node. So the performance we define as, uh, we, we calculate performance as one over runtime, so that greater performance is better. Uh, and then we normalize to FAIR. So we use FAIR as a baseline. Uh, so a 1.0 indicates that it uh, provided application performance uh, equivalent to that under a sort of naive power capping solution. Um, we use, I should have mentioned this before, we use the NPV benchmark, which has 10 applications. Um, the way that we construct our clusters uh, or the way that we set up our experiment is we take a 20 node cluster or an N node cluster, we divide it into two. On one half, we run one application and on the other half, we run a, a second application uh, to simulate the fact that in a real data center, there are different applications with different power needs in this environment. And that's how power movement actually happens is because we have a sort of heterogeneity in power usage and need. 
Um, to implement this, what we do is there's 10 applications. We look through all sort of n squared combos of uh, pairs of applications. Um, and uh, on the x axis, we vary how much power, uh, the sort of system wide power cap per node. Uh, to simplify it, how I wrote it was um, how much power is initially given, uh, or how much sort of power would be given per socket per node in a fair system. So we have 60 to 100 watts. Um, and we average, we take a geometric mean across all application pairs for each uh, different power cap. So what we see here is that under nominal conditions, nothing's failing, scale isn't very large. Penelope is keeping up pretty well. Uh, it, there isn't any really meaningful performance degradation just by using a decentralized approach. Um, Penelope is providing large benefits in terms of, you know, there it has inherent features that make it I think a more preferable system, which we will evaluate soon. But even under, you know, even in a, in a scenario that's highly advantageous for a centralized system, there isn't any significant loss to moving to a decentralized approach. Under faulty conditions, where we induce a failure to Slurm's central server partway through execution of each pair, we see a pretty massive degradation for the centralized server. Um, what it means to be below 1.0 here is that it is actually working worse than uh, if we had just done a naive power capping solution to start. Um, this makes sense for sort of two reasons. First is when the server goes down, however power caps are allocated at that point in time, freeze now because there is no mechanism for power to move. Uh, so if that is not very advantageous later on, that could cause problems. Additionally, the local deciders may not know when the server will come back up. So messages still need to be being sent. Uh, so we have an issue where still some overhead is going to be inherent. Whatever overhead is going to be inherent on these nodes, but we're not getting any power movement benefits. Um, Penelope, on the other hand, obviously inducing failures uh, doesn't have a central single point of failure dependency. Uh, so it sort of remains robust under these conditions. So finally, we want to evaluate how these operate at scale. We want to evaluate how how vulnerable a centralized approach is to scalability concerns and how robust Penelope remains. Um, we measure really, so, so we, we define two metrics, power redistribution time and turnaround time. Now, an inherent problem is that we don't have access to the scale, so we are simulating nodes. And because of the nature of that simulation, we can't run actual benchmarks, actual applications. So we construct a scenario where we divide the cluster in half again. Um, Half of the nodes are infinitely power hungry. They will soak up any power they can get their hands on. Uh, and the other half are don't have, have excess power to give. So what we measure in power redistribution time is how long does it take for power to move from the nodes with excess to the nodes that are sort of infinitely consuming power. And turnaround time is effectively server response time. How long does it take on average for a node to get a response uh, for a request power? for a request for power. In a centralized system, this is the response time to the server. In a distributed Penelope setting, it's when I, whenever I randomly send a message to someone else, how long does it take for me to get a response? Um, and if I'm able to just go locally, that's factored into that because then there's no network involved at all. Um, there are two variables that we're varying here. The first is frequency. So as I mentioned before, we're looping every second that frequency could stand to increase. And a large reason that it's set at a second is really hardware constraints. Um, the mechanism that we're using, uh, Intel's RAPL tool, uh, needs some amount of time for you know, power to adjust. And, and there's some error threshold there. So cutting that too low could cause er issues with power reading. But that technology could stand, stands to improve uh, or vary in, in the techniques with which power is measured. So it stands to reason that the frequency with which we can iterate can increase. Uh, over time. Uh, additionally, we obviously vary simulated scale. Um, so the first is that I, I'm going to show sort of median and total redistribution. Time. What I mean by median is how long does it take for 50% of the available power uh, to move? Total redistribution time is how long does it take for our system to reach equilibrium, in other words. Um, so median redistribution time, we see that um, at pretty low, and, and we're varying frequency here. Um, when uh, at pretty low frequency, uh, a centralized approach still remains pretty good. And that makes sense. It is going to be the most efficient way to move power uh, between nodes is if you have some guy who has total knowledge of the system. 
Um, but as frequency increases, we see that Penelope gets pretty significantly better, uh, indicating that you know, clearly it's using a random approach right now, random querying, as it's able to make more random queries, um, the difference between a sort of decentralized approach and a centralized approach really collapses. And this curve could stand to improve with more advanced um, algorithms for seeking, for, for choosing who to query when looking for power and, and coming up with more advanced ways to look for power in a system. Uh, total redistribution. Now this shoots up. And the reason it shoots up is a fun fact, which is that at high frequency, Slurm server starts dropping packets. When it starts dropping packets, that means that it's dropping power. Someone is saying, hey, I got power. And the Slurm server says, I don't know what's happening. And there's basically a loss of information. Power, all the power isn't shifted. So in other words, it sort of loses by default. It never moves all the power. Um, whereas, you know, Penelope is fine. Uh, as we increase frequency, that's not a problem. Um, the scale here is fixed at our largest setting, which is 1056 bytes. Um, secondly, we're going to look at turnaround time now. Just a reminder, this is sort of server response time. Um, this correlates pretty well with the sort of total redistribution time here. As that starts to collapse, we see that the response time shoots up. And it's really only leveling off because it's dropping packets. Um, uh, Penelope, on the other hand, is pretty much constant. It's not literally at zero. Um, that's just more of, more of a factor of scale. Um, but the thing is, is that it can often look locally. Uh, and even when it's, it, because there's no single node, we're, we're splitting in an amortized sense, splitting uh, message load across the system. Uh, there isn't any one node that's getting overburdened. So it makes sense that that wouldn't vary with frequency because you're not really overloading any single node. Um, now, when we look at varying scale, um, turnaround time, which is on the right, uh, sort of the same trend here. Um, you know, as we vary scale, it makes sense that, again, we're, we're, there, there are more messages being sent in a distributed setting, but there's also more servers to respond to those requests. So that remains roughly constant. Um, on the other hand, a sort of Slurm centralized server is increasing. It, it's getting more and more load as scale increases. So that response time is increasing as we go. Um, median redistribution time. So at 1,056 nodes uh, with one second frequency, which is what these are fixed at, um, Slurm server doesn't drop. Now, what we would indicate is that as the server response time is increasing, that's in a clearly untenable pattern and trend. And then, and as that scale increases beyond 1,000 nodes, a very reasonable thought in a age with large data centers, um, we think that this sort of centralized approach would be highly untenable. Another point that we would make here is, um, Penelope is very constant across scale, uh, indicating that it's not degrading as scale increases. And as we've seen in empirical data on real applications, at, at the scale that we've evaluated, Penelope's performance is very identical, uh, very, very similar under nominal conditions and highly favorable under failing conditions. Um, so we believe that, you know, although there is a gap here, um, this really indicates that a decentralized approach sort of remains robust in scaling uh, in scaling context has much has, has great benefits and fault tolerance and even if we take out all of those things it competes very well with a centralized approach um, some related work here uh, having to do with uh, different ways to shift power different algorithms with which to sort of shift power and different tools uh, that raffle paper is you know, the, in talking about the RAPL tool that we use to actually measure node level power caps, there's obviously a large swath of data on that. Um, I should also clarify, we're looking at CPU-based power capping. There's obviously work into other forms, GPU, et cetera. Um, but yes, just to conclude, um, enforcing system-wide power caps, hugely important. And all the existing dynamic solutions rely on central servers to do this. Um, even with redundancy and things like that, we have a central dependency in a highly, in a large, highly distributed setting, um, which is just really, really, really disadvantageous. Um, Penelope addresses both the scalability and the fault tolerance concerns uh, without degrading performance in sort of nominal settings, um, and clearly holds up in scaling and fault tolerance settings, um, which we think provides a really, really meaningful uh, improvement over sort of state-of-the-art centralized approaches.
Uh, and finally, just to some acknowledgements, I'd like to thank Hank Hoffman, uh, my advisor during this project, and Harper Zhang, uh, whose uh, sort of work early on really helped contribute to this, uh, and E.H. Zach for uh, all of my diagrams and color schemes. Thank you. <laughs>